Once producer Tomiyuki Tanaka received a tentative go-ahead on his giant monster project, there was still one possible roadblock which he faced. Would it be possible to create the monster within the constraints of time and budget allowed? To answer that question, Tanaka needed to talk to Eiji Tsuburaya, head of the special effects group at Toho. Eiji Tsuburaya, renowned as the father of Japanese special effects, was quite receptive to the idea of making a monster film. While working for Nakatsu in Kyoto during the 1930s, Tsuburaya had seen fellow special effects wizard Willis O'Brien's monster classic King Kong. It was a defining moment. The experience had a profound effect on Tsuburaya, intensifying his interest in special filming techniques and imprinting on him a burning desire to make a monster movie of his own someday. Listening to Tanaka's idea and seeing a chance to fulfill his dream, Tsuburaya enthusiastically embraced the project. Even though such a project had never been attempted in Japan and he privately was unsure how it could be done, it was Tsuburaya's trademark to accept any challenge. In his nearly 20 years of work in the field of special effects to that point, Eiji Tsuburaya had gained a reputation as a man of unique vision, an innovator who combined daring camera work with makeup and miniature effects to create a unique alternative reality, mostly in the realm of films about World War II and aviation. While Tsuburaya had a knack for creating images that few others could imagine, he now faced a challenge unlike anything he had attempted before. Although he had the greatest respect for the model animation used in King Kong and sincerely wanted to use this technique, Tsuburaya faced up to the grim fact that there was no one in Japan who was experienced in model animation. Even if there had been, the constraints of time and budget would not permit him to use this technique. Tsuburaya estimated that the film would take as long as seven years to fully produce with model animation rather than the handful of months which he would be allowed. While he agonized over the decision, ultimately Tsuburaya realized that the only alternative open to him was to use a costumed actor and miniatures to create the illusion of a gigantic creature. Contrary to popular belief, using a man in a suit hardly made the task any easier. While the concept sounded simple, this would be the first time anything of this nature would be attempted, so there was no established procedure or guidelines for how to build or even how to operate such a suit. The staff was completely on its own, having to rely on their ingenuity. Like much of this groundbreaking production, the process of making a suit was trial and mostly error. The concept of the monster's look had never been made clear while the story was under development. Original story author Shigeru Kayama had only thought of Godzilla as a sea monster. To assist in visualizing the concept, artists from all over Japan were invited to submit designs for the project. The first submitted were from cartoon artist Kazuyoshi Abe, based on a recommendation from Kayama. Drawn in less than an hour, Abe's rendering of the beast had strange simian-like features with a head shaped like a mushroom cloud. This was not the dinosaurian image that the staff expected, so art department chief Akira Watanabe and sculptor Teizo Toshimitsu tried their hand at design using a children's dinosaur encyclopedia and a special dinosaur issue of American Life magazine for inspiration. Their mission was to find something original, something which could easily be thought of as having been created by an atomic blast. By combining the images of a Tyrannosaurus and Iguanodon and then adding backplates similar to those of a Stegosaurus, they hit on a unique yet highly recognizable design. Three rows of backplates were decided on based on aesthetics rather than function, and this helped distinguish the monster from a real creature, whether living or extinct. Once the basic monster image was settled, it was left to Teizo Toshimitsu to translate this design into three dimensions. Toshimitsu was a sculptor who had been friends with Eiji Tsuburaya since the time the pair had lived in Kyoto. When the two met by chance during May 1954, Tsuburaya asked his old friend to join the production of his monster movie. Having worked several years before as an art assistant and miniature maker on the Tsuburaya war film The Battle at Sea from Hawaii to Malay, Toshimitsu was happy to sign on and he joined the studio on June 1st. Toshimitsu sculpted several variations of the monster in clay. His first rendition closely resembled a Tyrannosaurus, but with a large, wide head. At close to 40 centimeters tall, this model was covered in serpentine scales for suggesting the appearance of a sea creature. For the second model, 
The head size was reduced and the serpentine features were eliminated in favor of adding more bulk to the lower torso. This was done to create a more massive and ponderous look. This design, dubbed the Warty Godzilla, used large rounded bumps for skin texture. The third and final model was dubbed the Alligator Godzilla, using the same physical characteristics and proportions as the Warty Godzilla, but substituting an irregular skin texture of small linear bumps for skin detail. It has been written that this incorporated the horrible disfigurement that Godzilla must have experienced when exposed to the atomic bomb. The alligator version was approved as Godzilla's final look. Toshimitsu took charge of suit construction. The prototype suit was built by brothers Kanzi and Yasue Yagi, together with Eizo Kaimai. The Yagi brothers had worked for Tsuburaya at a special effects institute since the war, and Kanzi also had prior work experience with Toshimitsu. The making of the suit was carried out under top secret conditions at Tsuburaya Special Effects Institute. No one was allowed in without permission. Kanzi Yagi took the lead in blocking out the body cavity for the suit actor by using thin wires and bamboo, wrapping them in chicken wire for support, and then covering this form with fabric and cushions. To add the skin, a huge block of solid latex was acquired and melted in a large barrel, the Yagi brothers stirring the mixture by hand. The liquefied latex was then applied to the suit as a skin. Small details were made of latex and glued onto the body, and finally the costume was lacquered a charcoal gray. Despite popular misconception that Godzilla is green, his color was always charcoal gray until Godzilla 2000. Although it later became common practice to use a zippered opening along the back for the actor to enter, the opening on the back of the first suit was held together by small rounded hooks, and when these failed, simple wire was used to close the suit's opening. The suit was designed so the actor's head was inside of Godzilla's neck. Small holes were punched into the neck through which it was expected that an actor could see and breathe. The suit's height was altogether two meters. When the suit was completed, the entire special effects staff assembled on a hot June afternoon in stage number two for a test fitting and to see what kind of performance could be achieved. When the actor was sealed inside, the mood was upbeat since the suit looked good, but when the actor was asked to move, nothing happened for a few moments. Finally, the foot moved and not even 10 meters later, the suit collapsed in a heap. The actor was unable to move almost anything from within. The main problem was the latex material used for the skin. Being a relatively new material and in scarce supply in Japan, the latex which had been obtained was of a crude grade which proceeded to cure hard as a rock, much to the surprise of the staff. The suit's joints had also been constructed without any slack, making any movement from within impossible. Not only was the suit unyieldingly inflexible, its total weight was well in excess of 100 kilograms or 220 pounds. These burdens made the suit completely impractical for filming. By concentrating so hard on the design of the suit, the staff overlooked the practical considerations of how to operate it. A second suit had to be built in short order. Despite the staff's best efforts to improve the flexibility of the suit and to decrease its weight, the improvements made to the second suit were relative. Made with urethane foam stuffed with bamboo pieces and cotton and covered with liquid plastic, this suit was lighter than the prototype, yet its weight still was in excess of 100 kilograms and it was still quite stiff. Compared with the prototype costume, the second suit looked more human-like with larger arms and a more upright posture. The bulk of the lower body gave the suit a convincing look of great mass. The face had rather rounded features and when viewed frontally or from above, gave a very dragon-like impression. The eyes were unique among all subsequent Godzilla designs. The pupils were small and round, almost unnervingly expressionless. Though generally positioned in the center of the eye, at times the pupils were located at the bottom of the eye opening, making it look as if the monster was gazing down. Three prominent rows of fins adorned the back, each somewhat thin and with more pointed tips than would later become the norm. The tail was made of progressively smaller segments of solid urethane which eventually tapered to a point.
Since this was the first time to use a suit in this manner, little thought was given to the interior lining. The rough fabric used rubbed against the actor's sweaty skin, causing numerous abrasions and sores. Even worse, the suit was built to fit snugly, compounding the problem. The bulk of the legs and the widespread of the four toes made walking a cumbersome task, and it was not uncommon for the actors to quite literally trip over their own feet and stumble while performing. Control of the suit was completely manual. The minimal mouth and eye movements of the suit were wire controlled by Azo Kaimai, while the tail was controlled by an overhead wire. Suit construction was the most obvious example of the trial and error nature that characterized the entire production. So as not to waste the effort expended on the prototype costume, it was put to use by cutting it in half. Azo Kaimai fitted the bottom half with suspenders so the suit actor could wear it for close-ups of the feet stomping through miniature structures, saving him from suffering inside the suit when crushing the train tracks and wading through rows of buildings. Despite the improvements made on the second costume, the actor's ability to create performance was still greatly restricted. The suit was so inflexible that it could stand by itself when not in use. When being worn, walking in anything other than a straight line was all but impossible. The few holes in the neck were virtually useless to the stunt actor as sweat poured down his face and plugged up the holes. The combination of hot studio lights and non-existent ventilation inside the suit were so unbearable that the suit could be worn for but a few minutes at a time, assuming that the actor did not pass out first, as happened several times during the shoot. The temperature inside would easily reach 130 degrees. The monster actor was generally so exhausted after each take that he did not have enough strength to extricate himself from the suit. Over a cup of sweat would normally be drained out after filming. There was some advantage to the suit's inflexibility. Since Godzilla was supposed to have been originally a dinosaur, it should not move like a human and normal movement was all but impossible in this suit. While Eiji Tsuburaya may have regretted his inability to use stop-motion effects in Godzilla, the residual benefit was that it forced him to use his ingenuity and creativity to make the impossible possible. In the process, he pioneered the technique of suitmation. Tsuburaya is famous for commenting on the Japanese special effects industry, quote, Trick photography is a knowledge that our poverty has brought into being. Nowhere is it more evident than in Godzilla, which spawned 50 years of Japanese monster films.